Well, good morning, church family. Good to see you. Um, did uh, just want everybody to know today is Jerry's birthday. Not exciting. I believe he is 26 years old today. <laughs> so happy birthday, Jerry. <laughs> um, just a couple things. Uh, just a couple updates. So everybody know. Um, I know. Becky is still in the hospital, um, and they're just trying to figure some things out there. So nothing really new, I don't think, Jeff, right? Nothing new? Okay. Just some things to keep in mind, praying for her, just know how to pray. And then also, um, some have asked about some updates about um, Richard and Linda Mayberry. Of course, um, she had fallen and she was been in and out of the hospital and so forth and so on. They're just trying to figure some things out with that as well. Nothing necessarily new on that, um, but uh, talking with her the other day, uh, she did mention something, and I think it would be a blessing to them. And so if there's anybody that would like to help in a way, she mentioned about maybe having somebody come over once a week and help clean the house. Um, and so if that's something that you think that, hey, I could use uh, you know, spiritual gift in that type of way to be a blessing to somebody else in the church family, um, just see me and then we'll get everything set up and directed in that way for that, okay? Um, also, the uh, Dixie Ride was rescheduled. Uh, it should be for Saturday, uh, September 16th. Sign up sheet out there. Remember, there's no cost to you. You can bring friends and family as well, um, but you can just sign up there. And then next week, we're having a church picnic after service, okay? So just take note of that. Sign up sheet there as well if you'd like to... Um, bring something. It'll just be right over there at Riverbend Park uh, there in Middlebury, uh, but we'll have a good time. Chicken and drinks will be provided, and the only thing that uh, if you'd like to bring a side dish to share, that would be great, all right? Well, let's go ahead and go to Lord in prayer, all right? Lord, uh, thank you so much uh, as we've gathered here as your body. God, the purpose of us here being here is to worship you, and as we exalt our uh, voices, uh, as we lift our praises up to you, uh, I pray that you would be glorified. Um, as we spend time in edifying one another in truth, um, I pray that you would be glorified. I pray that as we seek to minister to one another, um, that you would be glorified in all of it. We are so grateful for your mercy and grace in our lives, and we thank you for working in our lives. And Lord, we pray for those that uh, do not know you, those that have not repented of sin and come to faith in Jesus. We pray that you would draw them unto yourself, that they would have a clear understanding of what the gospel is, and that they would uh, put their trust and faith in you. We're so grateful again for your goodness towards us. We don't deserve anything, and your mercy that renews every single day it's just amazing. Pray that uh, we would worship you in spirit and in truth. In the name of Jesus, that we pray all these things. Amen. Good morning. Please stand with us as we worship.
for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life.
In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought.
we're going to spend some time, uh, have some testimonies and uh, prayer here. And uh, let's see, James, you are up, okay? We'll, uh, so if you have a testimony or a prayer request, just slip up your hand. James will come by and uh, you can share with the rest of the church family here. morning and uh, I have to have a surgery the 21st for gallbladder August 21st I have an echocardiogram Tuesday so hopefully everything will go well just keep me in your prayers because it's going through a struggle but with God's grace I'm going to make it so thank you for your prayers and I appreciate it okay so Mary's going to have surgery the 21st of August and she also has a test this Tuesday okay Anybody like to pray for Mary, upcoming surgery and the tests there? We'd like to pray for that. Okay, Alan right here. Yeah. Father, I pray for um, this request uh, for Mary as she uh, has the surgery on the 21st. I pray that this uh, test that she'll have this week will go well and so that she can proceed with the, the surgery. I pray for peace for her, for wisdom for the doctors. And Lord, we, we do thank you that you are the great physician and know exactly what's going on. And I do pray that everything will go well with that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Anybody else? Testimony or a prayer request like to share? It's not really a prayer request, just a uh, checkup on my leg, see how it's doing. That's uh, to, uh, this month, the 28th, at 7.15 in the morning, I go to the hospital, see how that's doing. Uh, right now, I'm doing real well. I feel I'm uh, walking real good and stuff. And so just keep that in mind that day in the morning, and uh, should everything should turn out okay on my leg. Okay. Thank you. All right, very good. Yes, Carrie, right back there. I would like to give praise to God. Um, my daughter, Carissa, out in Arizona, she, last Saturday, she went and bought a new car. Um, she has been in military training for over two years, and she's going to, she decided to buy a car now that she's almost done. And so she went Saturday with her friends and bought a car. They, she drove it back to the base. The next morning, Sunday morning, she got up and got in the car, two of her friends with her, to go to church. And somebody ran a stop sign and T-boned her on the driver's side. And um, there was someone on the passenger side in the front and the person in the back seat by the grace of God was on the other side not on the driver's side of the car so it was um, they went spinning and then went off the road and she said there was a very deep ditch and there was like a bush kind of a tree that they ran into that stopped them and she said if they would have went into that ditch she was pretty sure the car would have rolled and I just want to give praise to God. None of them were seriously hurt. They have some bruises and some little bit of um, soreness, but none of them were seriously hurt. The car is totaled, and it was <laughs> pretty disappointing the very next day, but the most important thing was their lives were spared. No one was seriously hurt or, or needing to be hospitalized. And I'm so grateful for God's protection over Amen. them. Amen. Yes. All right. Anybody else? Testimony or prayer requests? Okay, James, I think that's it. Thank you so much for your help. All right. Um, any of the children that would uh, like to be dismissed, you can head on downstairs, follow Miss Cindy and uh, also Miss Dorothy.
And I know we have some guests here uh, joining with us for the first time, and uh, so glad that you're here. We have been uh, working our way through understanding um, some spiritual gifts. I've uh, been working through some major passages of what uh, Scripture teaches about the gifts. And um, <clears throat> by the way, does anybody need a handout? Uh, if you need one, didn't get one, just slip up your hand. Uh, Adrian will get you one if you need one. Okay. Um, but we've been teaching these uh, principles here of uh, what the gifts are. And uh, we've been here in the largest section on spiritual gifts, which is uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. And this is really the most robust section that we find on spiritual gifts uh, in all of Scripture. Uh, chapter 12, we read about Paul um, really confronting these uh, charismatic Christians uh, because they claim to have all the gifts. Uh, that's why I say charismatic Christians. And um, how that they were basically misusing them in the church. Uh, that's, whole, that's Paul's whole uh, thing here in this letter. And uh, remember, the gifts are really are supposed to be a blessing to the church body. I mean, they're spiritual gifts given by God to be a blessing to the church so the church can be edified and uh, so the believers can grow um, in all of that. But if they are not used correctly and they're used incorrectly, they're no longer a blessing, but then they become a hindrance uh, in the body of Christ and they don't help. And so the, the purpose of the gifts, although very diverse, was really to, to bring unity to the body. Um, instead of unity in this church, we find disunity and we find division. And that's because uh, these believers here in Corinth, they weren't following what uh, they were supposed to be doing. Uh, and there was a lot of uh, pride. There was a lot of arrogance that was going on. And really, that's, that's what brings you into chapter 13, right? It's not a chapter on, you know, Paul wasn't like starting to get all romantic on us. But he was saying, look, you, you guys are not living and, and, and operating within the church family, you're not doing that in love. You're not using your spiritual gifts of love. Remember, then he gives that whole definition of what love is. Love is patient, love is kind, and then he tells us what love uh, is not. And so he tries to help them understand the answer to why disunity and division marked this church was because of their lack of love. They did not love one another. They did not show love towards one another. And we saw love really is the more excellent way to using spiritual gifts. Why? Because love is eternal. Uh, of those three things, right? We even have the verse up there, right? So now faith, hope, and love. Uh, so now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love, right? Because it's going to endure forever. It's going to endure for all of eternity. And uh, all those gifts that he mentions, he says that they're going to come to an end, but love is going to continue on forever. And so now we come to chapter 14, which Paul Wills is going to lay down some principles now for worship. And really, some of the things he's going to talk about is really how the church meeting is supposed to be taking place. And uh, he really tells us how certain gifts are to be used within the church. And specifically, Paul's going to deal with two spiritual gifts that these uh, Corinthian believers really prided themselves in, okay? Tongues and prophecy. And I mean, these were the two that they really, really prized the highest. Uh, these are the ones that they, that they really said, boy, if you can do these ones, boy, you're, you're more spiritual than other people. And uh, it caused a lot of uh, issues uh, there in the church. Now, remember, Paul is writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, okay? And so the truth that he gives here is still relevant today. It has not changed, okay? So it's not because, well, that was written back then, and, you know, we live in a different church age now, and things have kind of changed, and so, you know, the way gifts are used, they should be used differently now. No, sorry, this is this is still relevant for us today. And so no matter what, no matter how we feel, what our traditions are, what our opinions are, or what the church culture may be, 
I want to do my best here and allow Scripture to speak for itself. And so no matter what we're bringing to the table, I know that we all come from a different, diverse uh, set of backgrounds here. I want us all to come to Scripture and say, okay, what does the Scripture say? Not what my opinions are, not what my feelings are, not what my traditions are, but what does the Scripture say? And so I really want to make sure that we uh, keep with Scripture here this morning as we work through uh, these things about, uh, about tongues here. Now, in our church family, because of our different backgrounds and our different beliefs, if you are challenged today, okay, by what you're hearing, if it challenges your opinions, if it challenges your feelings, if it challenges your traditions, that's a good thing. That's very good because truth does that. God's, God's word does that. It challenges us, and that's how we grow uh, because we come to reality of what truth is, and we have to listen to truth. That's the only way that we're going to grow is we have to reckon with truth, and we have to walk in truth, okay? So if we're not willing to accept truth, then that's not going to help us, okay? So regardless of what your beliefs are on certain spiritual gifts, um, it is our aim to not make spiritual gifts a primary issue and allow for grace in each believer's life as we all edify and challenge each other to grow. And we hope as well that no one in this fellowship would make spiritual gifts a primary issue by attempting to impose their gifts or convictions on the rest of the church body here either. So that would surely not edify any of us. So my prayer is that we all can grow in the grace and the maturity of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and worship him who is worthy. So here's what I'd like for you to take away with you today. Spiritual gifts are beneficial to the church only when used correctly. Spiritual gifts are, a, are beneficial to the church only when they are used correctly. So let's take note here of a few things here. Okay, number one, prophecy is better than tongues in public worship. Now, it's interesting to know, we're going to be here in uh, 1 Corinthians 14. It's interesting to note of how much tongues were emphasized in this church. And I think we still see a lot of that today, right? That tongues are the main thing, right, that, that everybody is, is all about. And uh, however, you'll notice Paul's words here. He tells us that prophecy is better than tongues, in public worship. We saw in chapter 12 when Paul began listing all those spiritual gifts. Where did he place tongues on the list? Was it first or was it last? It was last. He was trying to help them to understand tongues is not the main deal. Tongues is not the big deal, right? It's not the main event. Uh, so he, he tries to help them grasp that. And so we could gather that some gifts are superior to others while implying that tongues are inferior. And what he Im implied earlier, he's going to simply state now in this passage that we're going to look at, by contrasting tongues with prophecy. And he's going to show us why prophecy is so much better than tongues. And he's going to give us the reason why. So let's read these verses here, okay? 1 Corinthians 14, 1 through 5. Pursue love. See, he's continuing on from chapter 13. Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially what? That you may prophesy. For one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men, but to God. For no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the Spirit. On the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. The one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. Now, I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets so that the church may be built up. 
Now, this would have been some very hard words to hear. If you were a believer in this church at Corinth, and you got this letter, and you heard it read, this would have been some very difficult, difficult truth to have to deal with. Tongues was what this church was known for. And now Paul is telling them for public worship, prophecy is way better than tongues. Sadly, what's seen in several churches today is this overemphasis on tongues. Now, I'm not saying tongues are wrong or that God doesn't use them. Neither was Paul here. However, tongues have a place just like any of the other spiritual gifts in the church, but it's not the superior one. And so let's look at the definition here a little bit more about tongues. Right? Now, there are people that, that differ on the definition of what tongues really is. Right? What, what is it? Okay? Um, and so let me give you a few things of each one of these. Right? So first of all, the word tongue translated in our English Bibles means both the tongue of the human body and languages. This expression of speaking in tongues gives the impression of a strange experience rather than just speaking languages. So what is speaking in tongues? What is it? There's two views that are pretty much put forth, and this is where people differ on what they are. Okay? So here's the first one. Some believe that speaking in tongues is prayer or praise spoken in ecstatic communication with God that results in an unknown language or an unknown tongue that is not understood by the speaker. We can clearly see these in 1 Corinthians 14.2, 1 Corinthians 14 through 17, and 1 Corinthians 14.28. Now I say ecstatic here because much of what is seen and practiced, I believe, today in churches with this manifestation of tongues is uncontrolled. It's just let loose, let it go, we're just gonna go say whatever, right? And so it's this ecstatic communication. Do you remember back in 1 Corinthians 13 when Paul says, if I speak with the tongues of men and angels, right, but I do not have love, he says, I become what? Clashing symbol, right? This thing that, uh, you know, it just... It's interesting that Paul talks about that because back in that day, they actually used symbols in pagan worship. Now, again, I'm not saying that because you have symbols that you're doing things that are pagan, okay? Anything can be used for evil, right? Okay? But he's saying that by just doing this uncontrollably, they would, they would excite themselves up in such a frenzy that he's saying that's what it's like. It's just like you're just, just doing it, just doing it, just doing it, just doing it, okay? So this is followed sometimes by frenzied and disorderly conduct in the worship service. People saying, I'm going to lose awareness of their surroundings, losing self-control. One of the fruits of the Spirit is to be what? Self-control. So how can you be so frenzied and so out of it and so not controlled and filled with the Spirit, but yet you're not self-controlled? So that's why I say ecstatic here, okay? I came across a video with a guy named uh, Sid Roth who was going to teach people on how to speak in tongues. You can look up the video yourself. Just Google Sid Roth uh, teaches people how to speak in tongues. And so he's got a whole audience there, and he's going to teach everybody to speak in tongues. Now, time out. If you have the spiritual gift of tongues, would you have to be taught how to speak in tongues? No. Okay? You would, it wouldn't have to work that way. Okay, because it's a manifestation of the Spirit, right? And not only that, it's not when we want to do it, is what Paul teaches in 1 Corinthians 12. It's a manifestation of the Spirit when he does it, okay? So on this uh, video here, Sid Roth is going to teach people on how to speak in tongues, and he says to the audience, you start by speaking little baby words, Right? 
you, you start by speaking little baby words and say them as fast as you humanly can. Where is that in the Bible? Is it in the Bible? Start by speaking little baby words and say them as fast as you can. Does Paul have anywhere scripture that says, this is how you speak in tongues, start with little baby words and say them as fast as you can? No, he doesn't, okay? He then says, the supernatural will become the natural. He then tells everyone to start praying in a language that you've never been instructed so everyone in the audience begins speaking these little baby words. Everybody's doing it all at the same time, right? All of them doing it, okay? He then says, I know that you don't know what you're saying. Make those nonsensical syllables into non-nonsense. What? Then he says, do it faster. I said faster. Do it faster. Then he says, if I had a gun in your ribs, you could do it faster. Does that sound biblical to you? No. no. Okay? That sounds strange and weird. Okay? Now, please don't under, understand me here. Okay? Do I believe that tongues exist? Yes, I do. Okay? But I believe a lot what is propagated in many churches today is false and it's not real. Okay? And so, what is actually tongues? Do we actually got a real good biblical description of this? Well, there's some examples of it in Scripture. What does it sound like? Okay. So this definition indicates that speaking in tongues is primarily speech that is directed toward God, such as prayer or praise. And I think we see, we see examples of that uh, in Scripture. And because of this, it is different from prophecy. Why? Well, because prophecy is getting messages from God toward people in the church is where the tongues are prayer or praise to God. And so Paul says, one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men, but to God. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 14, 2, and later we'll see also in 1 Corinthians 14, 28, he, he kind of emphasizes that. And so we'll see here, he's going to lay down some principles here of public worship. Uh, that those who speak in a tongue, if there is no interpreter present at the church service, they are to what? Keep silent in the church and speak to himself and to God. Do I have a problem with anybody speaking in tongues? Nope. Do I have a problem if you pray in tongues? Nope. But if there is not an interpreter, you are to keep silent in the church and you are to speak to God and pray to God by yourself. That's clearly taught in Scripture. So concerning tongues, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, 2, the person who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men but to God, for no one understands him. So see, this is how we can get this idea that this language that is being spoken we don't understand it. We, we can't understand what they're saying. We don't know what, it's supposed, what it sounds like, right? right? But he utters, he says, mysteries in the Spirit. Later in verse number 11, Paul says, if someone is speaking in tongues without interpretation, no meaning will be communicated because we will be as a foreigner to the one listening to the tongue. So that's the first definition that people like to use to define tongues, okay? Now here's the second one. Others believe that tongues were known languages that were understood by those who heard. We see this in Acts chapter 2, verse number 6, when the uh, disciples are there in the upper room, uh, the Holy Spirit comes upon them. They begin to speak in tongues. And so they're out there. They're praising God. And you have all these people from different language groups out there. And they are listening to these Galileans speak. But yet they hear what they're saying in their own language. So it'd be like me talking just like I'm talking English here. But let's just say we had somebody who was from Tanzania in here. 
And as I'm speaking in English, all of a sudden you hear exactly what I'm saying in your own language. That's pretty amazing. Okay? So we see that. The disciples who were Galileans were speaking in Galilean, but yet being understood in many different languages in Acts 2 7. And so it seems that speaking in tongues may involve speech in actual human languages that are understood by some of those who hear. So some might argue, but in 1 Corinthians, Paul says when they are speaking, no one understands. So therefore, it's an unknown and not a human language. However, if I spoke in Danish or Hadza, it would be unknown to me and those who also who have never heard it as well. On the other hand, one could argue that even though we have the one instance of the tongues in Acts chapter 2 about them speaking, and these are known languages, does that mean that this is what the standard was for every instance? So who's correct? Who's right? And see, this is, this is what people tend to kind of argue over. You know, well, is it an unknown language? Is it a known language? Which one is it? Well, the point Paul is making in this text is not the point of whether somebody is speaking in a tongue or not, right? He believed that people spoke in tongues. Later on, he'll actually say that I speak in tongues more than you all, right? So the point is not that. What is the point that Paul is trying to help them grasp? Is the church being edified? That's the main point. And see, that's what we got to come to when we talk about spiritual gifts, when we're using our spiritual gifts, is the church being edified? If it's not being edified, it's not helping the church. It's actually hindering the growth and the maturity of the church. And I believe that's why Paul spent all that time out of uh, 1 Corinthians 13. So let's look at the characteristics of tongues that Paul addresses out of this passage here. Okay, so regardless of where you land on the definition of tongues, whether they were known languages or unknown languages, okay? we should be able to agree on the characteristics of tongues, which Paul gives us here in 1 Corinthians 14. Let me summarize uh, them for you here. Okay? First of all, tongues are an inspired utterance. I think we can all agree with that, right? 1 Corinthians 12.3, 1 Corinthians 12.7, verse 10, verse 11, and also 1 Corinthians 14.2. They are an inspired utterance. It's a manifestation of the Spirit of God. Secondly, tongues are primarily addressed to God. And so this really seems to involve prayer. This prayer and this praise given over to God. Paul said that he prayed in tongues and spoke in tongues more than all that were those uh, in Corinth. Thirdly, tongues are not normally understood by the speaker or the hearers unless interpreted. I think we see that clearly, 1 Corinthians 14, 2, uh, verse number 5, and also verses uh, 13 through 15. He says, therefore, one who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret, because he doesn't even understand what he's saying. Uh, for if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. So if, I, if my mind's not involved with this, if I'm not understanding... It's unfruitful for me. I'm not getting what what I'm actually even saying. And so tongues are not normally understood by the speaker or the hearers. Those who speak in tongues are to be self-controlled. Speaking in tongues is not an involuntary act. 1 Corinthians 14, 28, Paul says, If there is no one to interpret, let each of them keep silent in church and speak to himself and to God. So that means you can control yourself, right? It's not this thing like, I'm so overtaken by the Spirit of God, I gotta say it, right? No, you can control yourself. You can keep quiet if there's no interpreter, right? Verse 32, he says, uh, and the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. So there is control there. The content of tongues appears to be praise and adoration rather than revelation. That's what prophecy is for. So it's for praise and adoration rather than revelation. 
And finally, tongues are a sign for unbelievers, those that do not know Christ. 1 Corinthians 14, 22, he says, Thus tongues are a sign for believers, are not for believers, but for unbelievers, while prophecy is a sign not for unbelievers, but for believers. Okay? So Paul says, let's look at this other definition now. So that's a pretty good, well-rounded thing about tongues. Now let's look at this other definition about prophecy. Paul says, prophecy is better than tongues. So having given you this definition and characteristics of, of tongues, let's look here at prophecy and try to define that a little bit more. Now we're going to come back to prophecy again next week because it's very important at use within the church. Okay, And we'll see that a little bit. But I really kind of want to just kind of give you a good footing so that way you can draw some things from it. Okay? So first of all, in the Bible as a whole, a prophet is one who speaks directly for God, whether in foretelling the future or forthtelling, proclaiming divine instruction for the present. Prophecy is not adding to Scripture or revealing new Scripture, nor is it the Word of God today. Those who believe that certain gifts have ceased, cessationalists, um, I, I used to hold to uh, cessationist-type views that I believe that certain spiritual gifts have passed away, but after reading the Bible, right, <laughs> and coming to an understanding of what Scripture teaches and not just listening to what this person says, what that person says, and, and say, okay, what does Scripture say here, right? Um, they like to kind of lump all of these things in, and they say, well, okay, well, prophecy, that's dealing with Scripture, and so those that prophesy, they're giving us new Scripture. That's not the intent at all. Um, so prophecy is more than just what was seen in the Old Testament and the New Testament, and we'll develop this thought a little bit more uh, next week. But in simple terms, prophecy is telling something that God has brought to your mind. 1 Corinthians 14, 30-31, Paul says, If a revelation is made to another sitting there, let the first be silent. 1 Corinthians 14, 25, he says, the secrets of his heart are disclosed, and so falling on his face, he will worship God and declare that God is really among you. So this whole idea that, that prophecy, you have this revelation from God, and it's coming to your mind, okay? And you are giving that out in your own words, humanly speaking, okay? We're just giving out these, the, the thing that God has brought to our mind. Now, I think we see this a lot in churches, but we do not classify it as prophecy. How many times has this ever happened to you? Maybe you're laying in bed, sound asleep, and all of a sudden, it's like your eyeballs go click, and it's like God has brought somebody to your mind and said, you need to pray for that person right now. What is that? Ooh, no. What is that? I believe that's prophecy. How about this? You're sitting in a prayer meeting. Everybody's praying. God brings some things to your mind, and he says, I want you to pray for this person. What is that? That's prophecy. How about you're talking to an individual, and God brings something to your mind. He says, you need to tell them this. What is that? It's prophecy. And so we see this kind of stuff, but I don't think we really define it as that way, all right? Paul indicates that God could bring something spontaneously to mind so that the person prophesying would report it in his or own words. And Paul calls this a revelation. I heard a story of a missionary visiting a church and was speaking. And while he was speaking, he paused and said, I didn't plan to say this, but it seems the Lord is indicating that someone in this church has just walked out on his wife and family. 
Not knowing who was in the audience, there was a man who had entered the church for the first time that fit that description. And God spoke directly to him through that prophecy. The man acknowledged his sin and made himself known and sought God. So I I think there's instances of this happening from time to time that God uses within the church to help the church and to edify it. And so because of how God uses prophecy in the church, that's why Paul says this, that prophecy is a sign for believers. When we come together as believers in Christ, what are we supposed to be doing? Yes, we're worshiping God, but we are to be edifying one another. How is that going to happen? Does that happen only because of one person standing up here is in charge to edify you? It's all of us together as a whole. We are all supposed to be working together within the church body to edify one another using our spiritual gifts within the church meeting. So that means, Reba, you have something to say. That means, Mary, you have something to say. You have something to say. You have something to say. We're to be edifying one another, okay? And we'll see this laid out later in Scripture as what he talks about how the church meeting is supposed to work, okay? But that's what, that's what church is supposed to be about, edifying one another so we can all grow in maturity in Christ. So let's look at another few things here, okay? Why is prophecy better? Well, there were significant differences between these two gifts, Okay. differences which under normal circumstances made prophecy of greater value for the edification of the church. Why? Why is prophecy better than tongues? Or what makes tongues inferior to prophecy? Well, here they are. Number one, prophecy was not addressed to God, but to men, while tongues was addressed to God. Secondly, prophecy edified the church while tongues edified only the speaker. Thirdly, tongues were unintelligible to the speaker, and the hearer, while prophecy was understood both by speaker and hearer. And Paul even kind of gives some of these illustrations, right? He's like, if I walk in, or if if a person walks in, an unbeliever walks in, and they hear you all speaking in tongues, he's going to go, you guys are crazy. He's going to leave, right? But if there's prophecy going on, as what he says here, uh, but if all prophesy and an unbeliever or an outsider enters, he is convicted by all, he is called to account by all, and the secrets of his heart are disclosed. And so falling on his face, he will worship God and declare that God is really among you. So if verses 1 through 4 really establish the superiority of prophecy over tongues, verse 5 really clarifies the matter of this. Tongues are inferior to prophecy only when when uninterpreted, unless he interprets. So it would appear that tongues were normally not interpreted in Corinth, and thus were considered inferior to prophecy, but... If interpreted, tongues would have equal value with prophecy. Thus, in verse 26, both tongues and prophecy have equal exposure in the church meeting. That's why he says, if one has a tongue, one has a prophecy, right? Like, yeah, there it is in the church. But he says there has to be an interpreter. Without an interpreter, it doesn't help anything. And so, uh, under ordinary conditions, tongues should not be suppressed, but prophecy should be sought as the better of the two And when interpreted, tongues would edify as much as prophecy, but apparently this was seldom in the case in Corinth. In verses 6 through 12 here in chapter 14, go on to illustrate the importance of interpretation by demonstrating the uselessness of sounds which have no clear meaning. Look at verse number 6, what Paul says here in 1 Corinthians 14. He says, Now, brothers, if I come to you speaking in tongues, how will I benefit you? unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or teaching. And so Paul uses himself as this gracious example of saying, look, if I come to you speaking in tongues, you don't understand what I'm saying, how's that going to help? It's not. He says, I need to bring to you a teaching. I need to bring to you a prophecy. And so he could speak to them in tongues, but they would not understand. 
And so only as he spoke in a language they knew could give a revelation, a word of knowledge, a prophecy, or a teaching. So there's two examples of this that he's going to give us here in verses uh, 7 through 12 about understanding of how, comparing it to tongues, how important it is to understand, okay, being, being able to understand. So the first one he gives is musical instruments, okay? Now we got some good musicians up here that play musical instruments, okay? Does everybody know what a guitar sounds like? Hopefully, right? I mean, we know what it sounds like. We know what a piano sounds like. We know what a trumpet sounds like. But he gives this understanding here. He says, look, okay, musical instruments have a distinct sound. They have a distinct understanding. You say, oh, that's a, that's a trumpet. Well, that, that's a harp. That, that, that's a piano, right? We, we know that because we understand that, okay? Then he even gives this idea of, a, of, of like a troop, a, 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 an army, and he says, okay, the sound for, for us to like move forward is usually a bugle call, right? right? But he says, if you don't know what the sound is, how are you going to know what to do? Right? So it has to be understood. And so he gives that example of musical instruments. There is a distinction in tones. And so they ha- in order for it to be meaningful, you have to be able to understand what that tone is. Okay? Then he gives this other one, languages of men, verses 9 through 11. He says, so with yourselves, if your tongue, you utter speech that is not intelligible, how will anyone know what is said? For you will be speaking into the air. There are doubtless many different languages in the world, and none is without meaning. But if I do not know the meaning of the language, I will be a foreigner to the speaker, and the speaker a foreigner to me. And so it's important to understand even the languages. There has to be an understanding of the languages. And in verse number 12, he brings us back really to verse number uh, 5. So with yourself, since you are eager for manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. If you are so eager to see God moving right in the church, don't try to do it with all this fakery nonsense, Right? What should you be striving for? Edification of the church. You want to see God move? Let's edify one another. That's where it's at, okay? Let's finish this up here. 1 Corinthians 14, 13 through 19. He says, Therefore, one who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What am I to do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. I will sing praise with my spirit, but I will sing with my mind also. Otherwise, if you give thanks with your spirit, how can anyone in the position of an outsider say amen to your thanksgiving when he does not know what you are saying? For you may be giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not being built up. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than, you, than all of you. Nevertheless, in church, I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. And so these verses here, the second thing here, the use of tongues in worship, without an interpreter, it is to be done in private. These verses very evidently show that while the gift of tongues may edify the speaker in private, they will not edify in public unless there is an interpreter. The interpreter is key to all of this. There are at least three indications in chapter 14 that uh, that there's this private use of tongues, okay? That tongues are to be used in private unless there's an interpreter, right? Uh, So we see here, here they are. Number one, verses 13 through 15, the use is largely private, verses 13 through 15. Emphasis on with my spirit and with my mind, right? We see that. Verse 18 through 19, Paul said that he spoke in tongues more than the Corinthians, yet there is no record in Scripture anywhere where we see Paul actually speaking in tongues in public. What does that tell us? I believe Paul had the gift of tongues because he even says, I, he says, I speak in tongues more than you all. 
So I believe that Paul spoke in tongues, but I believe he did so in private. We don't have any indication at all in Scripture where he actually spoke in tongues in public, in any church meeting at all. And I think that's why he even says, I would rather speak five words than 10,000 words in a tongue, right? Thirdly, in verse 28, Paul instructs the tongue speaker to speak to himself and to God if there is not an interpreter present. And so we see this idea here that tongues are an amazing gift. They really are. But if it does not edify the church without an interpreter, Paul actually says in verse 13 that if you speak in tongues, you need to also pray that you can interpret. So there has to be an interpreter. Um, again, you know, as I've been growing through some of this stuff, like I used to, to kind of hold to the fact that, okay, so if you speak in tongues, uh, then you can't be the one that interprets as well. Because, oh, we don't know what you're going to say because you could be making up your own interpretation. But you know what? Here's the key to all that. Later on in 1 Corinthians 14, you know what he talks about? Judging. So when we come together, one has a tongue, one has a prophecy, one has a hymn, one has this, one has that. What is supposed to be happening within the church meeting? Judging. Judging what you say. Is what you said biblical? This is why the church should have men in the church who are spiritual. Guys, listen up. You need to be spiritual men that can lead. Spiritual men that can judge. This is why it's so important that you have a church with elders who are qualified men who can speak truth even when it's hard. So when we come together, if somebody says something and somebody says, that just does not sound right, that's where the judging comes in. Okay? This is all supposed to happen within the church meeting. And so Paul says, if you say something in a tongue, he says, I want you to also pray that you can also interpret the tongue. So if you don't even know what you're saying, why don't you also pray that you can pray for understanding of what you just said? If not, he says, you are to keep silent and only pray to God and to yourself. Because you will edify yourself, but it's not edifying to the rest of the church. And so the use of tongues is so important in all of this. Paul says the tongue speaker is to speak to himself and to God. And so if there's not an interpreter present, then they are to keep silent. And so it's very difficult to say amen if somebody is saying all kinds of stuff, right? Because we don't know. We can't agree with you, right, if we don't understand what you're saying. So let tongues be reserved for the prayer closet unless an interpreter is present. And that's Paul's whole thing. Let's edify the church, right? Let's do it correctly. But if, if there's not an interpreter for tongues, let's keep silent, okay? Let's pray together. Father, I thank you so much for your word, what it teaches, what it says. God, I understand that um, there's a lot of things in Scripture that are very hard to understand. There are things that we, we really wrestle with to try to really grasp the meaning. And God, I am an imperfect person. Uh, my mind is imperfect. My thoughts are imperfect. Um, and so, Lord, we want to do our very best in trying to grasp what your word says and so that we won't twist scripture, so that we won't say things that are not correct. And God, I pray that all of us in here will seek to edify one another, that we would seek to edify the church through our spiritual gifts. Help us to do that. Help us to understand how important edification is in the church body. We thank you so much that you have saved us through your son, Jesus. We thank you that the wrath, your wrath, was poured out upon your son, Christ. God, we don't deserve salvation, and we thank you so much for bringing us into your family. Help us to operate in the Spirit as you have called us to do and to edify 
one another in the body of Christ. I thank you for this body. I pray that you would be with them this week and help them to edify others and edify one another in whatever capacity that may be. And we ask all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Just a couple things I was reminded. Uh, I got the date wrong for the Dixie. It's not the 16th, okay? So not the 16th. It's the 9th, okay? So 